Hi everybody, I'm Joe Parker of the Pixel Depot. Today we're going to weather a covered hopper car using a number of different layered weathering techniques. Now often when I do a weathering project, I only use pan pastels for a, a quick and easy weathering project. But this time there were a number of effects I was looking for on the car, so I decided to dig a little deeper into my bag of weathering tricks. The techniques I'm going to cover in this video include India ink washes, painting and dry brushing with acrylics, Prismacolor erasable pigment pencils, pan pastel powders, that's a lot of peas, topic sketch markers, and oil paint washes. We've got a lot of ground to cover, so let's get moving. This video is brought to you in part by my patrons on Patreon. If you'd like to help support the channel and get some extras as well, you can follow the link in the description below to join the Pixel Depot's Patreon community for as little as $2 per month. The Patreon bonus for this video will be additional pictures of the weathering process. I'm also working on my first blooper reel, which should appear shortly, so check it out. Since I've started this channel, I find myself filming just about everything I do for the layout, or actually both layouts, which makes everything take a lot longer. So the other day I decided to just chill out and do a project just for me. I had a string of covered hoppers that I wanted to get ready for the layout, so I decided to weather the wheels and trucks using the method I used in my video on well, weathering wheels and trucks. When I'd finished that, I thought I should just go the rest of the way and do some weathering. At which point I then thought, people might want to see how I do that. And then everything came full circle, so here we are. So today I'm going to start with this Arco Polymers covered hopper and go through my process. As usual, if there are products that I mention, I will do my best to tell you where I got them and provide affiliate links to where you can purchase them. For some of those links, I do get a commission which helps to support the channel. So I bought this car because over the years I've watched a number of chassis system videos based in the era that I model, which is summer 1984, and seen similar cars running through on various trains. I'd always liked the Arco brand. They used to be on the East Coast when I was a younger child, and they moved out sometime when I was in my early teens, I think. And as it turns out, a friend of mine, Art Remne, his father used to work for Atlantic Richfield Corporation, so it seemed like a good fit. As I always do with weathering projects, the first thing I did was go to a number of websites to look for photos of prototype cars. I'll put links to those sites in the description below. So this car, which is an Atlas Master covered hopper, has a build date on it of 1977. As I mentioned, I model the summer of 1984, so this car is about seven years old. So when I went looking for photos, even though I couldn't find photos of this exact car, what I did was look for photos of the appropriate age. I found three pictures that sort of fit the bill, so I downloaded those. In this first photo, it looks brand new, almost perfect with very little weathering effect. In this other photo, the car looks very, very faded. I didn't want that effect because my memory of the cars I'd seen in the various videos didn't look that old and beat up or faded. I then found this photo, which seemed to be a middle ground, it's a bit of a Goldilocks picture, if you will, that had a bit of weathering, some fading on the top, but didn't look like it was really, really old and faded. So that's the one I decided to try and replicate. The things that I wanted to capture in the weathering of this car were the faded roof, the rusting areas around the supports for the roof walk, and the various grime and dirt that appeared as a sheen down the side of the car. I decided I could replicate those things using various tools that I already had in my weathering toolbox, even though there was going to be a variety of them. So let's talk about those now. I have washed my hands, and uh, my first step here is going to be to give the body of the car a quick wash or clean off, I guess, with 70% uh, uh, alcohol. That's what I have in, in this squirt bottle here. Run this across the car. Uh, as I mentioned, I just washed my hands, so there should be very little, if any, oil on them. And the idea here is just to uh, dilute any finger oils that might be on the car so that when I go through the, the weathering process I'm not leaving any fingerprints or, or anything else like that on the car. By using alcohol this is going to evaporate quickly and give us a surface that we can use in a very short amount of time. You definitely want to use the 70%. Uh, the 91% has the potential to take off the paint, so you don't want to do that for sure. Yeah. 
I started with a wash of India ink and alcohol for a couple of reasons. One is that if you look at the photo of the car, there's a quite obvious sheen of grime and a little bit of rust on there, and I thought that the washes would provide a good overall coating of those to provide that effect. The other thing that I wanted to avoid doing was an inadvertent fading effect that might happen because of the reaction between dull coat and alcohol. So what happens is if you coat a car with dull coat and then put alcohol over it, it does this weird effect of fading and modeling, and that's modeling with a T, not modeling with a D, that changes the color of the car. And sometimes you want that effect, but other times that's not what you're looking for. So let's start with the India ink washes. The next step will be to apply a couple of coats of the 1 to 60 India ink wash that I have. Again, this uses 70% isopropyl alcohol as its base and uses India ink to give it some... Um, dirty properties, I guess. Because of my excellent organizational skills, I can't locate my normal brush, but this one will do just fine. So I'm just going to dunk that in there and give it a good coat and just brush it across here. And you can see right away the difference that it makes, giving it some dirty look across there and you see I got a pretty good blob there that's not a big deal I'm just kind of dab it around so the dirt does not necessarily sit evenly on the car so having it bunched up like this is not a big deal next thing I'll do is just start here at the top and the reason I'm starting at the top is because gravity is my friend much like real weathering I want this to roll down the car Hopefully see that rolling down the car like that, if I don't block your view. Just kind of run across like that. Just let it naturally take the path that it wants to. Just doing a, a dab there so that it covers everything. Repeat on the other side, get up underneath those roof walks there. Not that that's that important, in a later step we're going to lighten those that area up pretty significantly, but we'll get to that in a little while. So over here, I think you'll get a, a good idea of the difference in the, in the color, especially in here as well. Um, and, you know, that's gonna, it's gonna blend in and dry as the alcohol evaporates, so it won't be quite as noticeable. But what this does do is give us a good base coating of grime. I'm just going to slobber a bunch of the mix in here, just to try and get coverage on those areas. It's not going to be perfect, and we will do some more. We will do some more weathering effects in there in a little later on in the show. We'll let that dry, see how it looks, potentially put another coat on. And after that, I do intend to put a an additional coat that is not black, that is more of a rust color uh, over the top of that, just to, again, blend the colors in a little bit, give it more depth and so on. So that's dried. And it's given it a, a nice coating. Well, it's mostly dry. There's still some bits in the, the lower sill here that are still wet, but that's that's okay. Um, but it's given it a nice sheen of grime. I'm going to give it one more quick coat. The top, I think, is good. The sides, I'd like to get a little more dirt in, especially right around that sill. The sill is where things seem to have not kind of blended in there as well as I might have hoped. So I'm just going to give that a quick dab so that it's got some color. Once again, we'll do some drying, and I'm going to come back and put on the rust color. If we move on to the, the burnt umber wash here, which is simply 
one teaspoon of the Burnt Umber India ink to a pint of 70% alcohol. And I'm just going to do the same thing there. And if we zoom in, hopefully you can kind of get that color. It's got a slightly different color than the black. It's more rusty colored. So we'll go across the top here with that. Let's see if we can get that to blend in underneath there. Run that across. Let gravity do its work. And when I say let gravity do its work and then you see me go across some more, all I'm doing when I go across is to make sure that the entire surface is wet and that will, and then gravity of course will do its work and bring that color down. This is really just to make sure that there's no, or a minimum of streaking. You might want the streaking, that might be an effect you're actually looking for. In this case I am not trying to avoid that. Actually as I look at it, uh, it's actually not that bad. Now you'll see, at least I can see, that the rust color is is gathering in under on that lip which is actually a good thing because if we go back to our picture our, our source picture that's exactly what happens oh, that's a lot brush might be a little too oversaturated but that's okay it's all it's all good so i'm actually gonna hit this side again my experience with this rust color is that it, it dries a little bit lighter than the black and what i'm noticing here is that it's this, uh, this wash is causing some of the black to run, but not a problem. You might find that if it's not uh, really, really set. Here you can see that the color is, is catching in that lip. And once the alcohol dries or evaporates, I should say, uh, that color is going to remain behind. All right, those washes have dried and They've left, as I predicted, they've left a rusty streak down at the bottom on both sides. Uh, one is a little bit more pronounced than the other. For the next step, I used a couple of Prismacolor erasable pigment pencils. These are kind of like colored pencils in that you can sharpen them with a regular pencil sharpener and they come to a nice point, but they also aren't really the graphite or colored pencil material that you're used to. These are more of an artist's pencil. So if we go back to our source photo, you'll notice that the seams on the car are darker than the rest. There's a noticeable line there, even if it is kind of light overall, it is a noticeable line. So one of the things I'm gonna do is use this Prismacolor pencil to highlight those. So one of the things that happens with this is it tends to go on dark, but with the final weathering that we're going to do later, it gets toned down uh, quite a bit. So all you really need to do here is just run that along the side of the seam there. And you'll notice, even comparing it to this one, uh, that that's a, a noticeable color change. So you can just use that seam as a guide. And that one's quite pronounced. So maybe sort of blend that in and, and remove some of the heaviness. I'm just using a pencil eraser here. Tone things down. I may have gone a little too heavy on that one side, so I'm trying to go lighter here. So those lines are pretty noticeable. Like I said, we can blend them in with the eraser a little bit here. Once we get a, a final coating of, of dust on there, they'll, they'll blend right in. The Prismacolor pencils come in all different colors. I've got white and black and some grays here as well. I will put uh, an affiliate link in the description below for these. So as I look at these, you know, I'm finding they're probably a bit too red. So I am gonna use the black one to try and tone things down a little bit. Should tone down the, the overt redness anyway. Now, as long as I'm here, I'm just gonna run the black along the this sill here, just to darken it up a little bit. Shade that down. Might be able to use a regular pencil for that, graphite pencil. So I have this and it's the black. May as well use what we got, right? A little too red in some spots, so I'm just gonna tone that down a little bit more. That is the beauty of, of all this stuff here. You can tone it down, you can blend it in, so on and so forth. 
So perhaps I shouldn't have gone with the Tuscan red at all and just used the black, but you live and learn. And as you'll see, I think it works out in the end. The next thing I did was to add some rust effects using a Vallejo product, which is called Rust Texture, which is part of their environment line of products. This is an acrylic paint that has texture built into it to provide not only the color of rust, but also the texture of rust. So if we go back to our photo once again, uh, you'll notice that along the, the top here, along these, these roof walk supports, there's, there's some, some rust along there that's, that's dripped down, and there's also some rust along this top sill. So I'm going to use my Vallejo rust texture paint and a micro brush to, to do some of that uh, detail work. I'm going to use some of the finer brushes that I have, and these I got from Micromark. I am an affiliate with Micromark as well, so if you go to Micromark and place an order, you can always use the code Pixel Depot when you're checking out as your coupon code, and that'll get you 10% off of your entire order. This is going to be more of a, a dry brushing technique, so I'm going to see how much of that I can get off so that I'm leaving a little bit of paint on there. You want to try to be as straight as possible when it comes to this. Let's focus on this one. There's nothing there. We just try to run the brush down a little bit, and now there's a there's a bead of well, there was until I wiped it off. There's a, a bead of paint there. And you can do that as, on as many or as few of these as you like. I'm gonna skip a couple of them. Again, over here on the picture, in this right-hand side here, there's, there's a lot of rust streaking. The other end looks like it's that way, too. Now, this picture is not a perfect match for this car. The picture shows a car that has a uh, support much closer to the edge. So what I'm going to do instead is kind of just go in here close up to the, the corner and sort of brush that in. The thing about this Vallejo paint is it, it's texture paint. So if I, if I really dip in there, I will get the texture of rust, um, but that's not what I'm looking for just yet on this. This area, a lot of the, a lot more of the, the wash collected in that area and stuck around. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this end a little bit rustier. And there, and we'll build that corner up. And because of that, I'm gonna have this run down even further onto the car. Blending with the finger there to get that in. Now where I am going to use the texture is up here along the sill. In the photo, along these areas here in the center, towards the center, along that sill, there's there's some rust. Not too much. You don't want to look like a total rust bucket because at this age they weren't really that rusty. I can run some of that down too. As I've done with previous cars, like the Penn Central Gondola that I did, with this textured paint, you can really go to town. But this car, as modeled, is only about seven years old. It wouldn't be so bad that it would be completely uh, torn up. can also do some of these effects on the back. I'm going to actually do some quick touches to the edges of the couple of the grab irons to give the effect that the bolts might have some rust. A little bit of rust, not too much rust. Using some of the natural places where the, the wash sat as my guide. Again, I'm just kind of, there's no pattern that I'm following, except, you know, there are some places on the car where, you know, I can see in the picture where things are. But I'm just using my knowledge of where things rust based on viewing photos and so on. A bit of imagination. These spots see, here underneath the ladder didn't get a lot of wash just because the, the it didn't flow in there. So I'm kind of hitting some of those places as well to give it some color. Don't want it to be too bright blue. Notice I have not dipped the brush in the paint for quite some time. And, you know, this goes a long way and even after I, I brushed a bunch of it off. That looks pretty good. Next thing that I'm going to do is I have these paint pens. Copic Sketch paint pens. These have two ends. There's a, a very fine end tip, you know, pointed tip, and then there is a, a chip end. You can use this to, to get a little bit of the effect of the paint 
or excuse me, the rust running down. And the other thing that you can do is use the lighter color to have something representing a, a newer rust. It doesn't come out as quite as noticeably on the dark color here as it does on other things. The car is still fairly shiny, which is uh, is interesting, um, but that's also because I didn't put any uh, any coating on it yet. So that's what I'm going to do next is uh, is give it a, a coat of dull coat because we're going to be pretty soon moving on to the the pan pastel portion of our program. The pan pastels require the matte sealer to give it some tooth. So at this point the effects look pretty coarse which brings us to our next step. The pan pastels that I'm going to use kind of blend everything together, tone everything down, and make it look more like a real car. Back after putting on the matte sealer, uh, I actually did something different this time. I didn't use dull coat. I actually went with the Krylon uh, matte chalky finish sealer. It gave an interesting texture here, uh, and it did cloud things up a little bit. It's faded the surface a little bit. Um, there is still, to be uh, completely open and honest here, there are still a couple of these places where I'm still not happy with the red and now that it's sealed I won't be able to go back and, and erase those so we're going to have to play with those a little bit. And the other thing is I have done nothing with the bottom just yet uh, so we'll have to uh, play around with that as well. If we look at our picture here you can see that the the top of the, the car is faded uh, quite a bit. Uh, I, I assume it's faded actually. It could be material or whatever that's sitting up there or dust or something like that. It's not quite as faded as this car appears to be in this particular photo, but this was, in my opinion, too too uh, faded for what I wanted to achieve. I just have it here for reference, but it is that same sort of fade between the two, um, so that's what I'm going to look for. What I'm going to use for that is uh, I have a, a light blue pan pastel that I tend to use for, for uh, fading blue cars. Uh, this is called uh, Thalo, Thalo Blue Tint. Um, I don't know how to pronounce that, so you'll have to, you'll have to forgive me. Um, and so we're going to use that. We're also going to use some gray. I have a number of grays here, so it's a matter of figuring out which one I'm going to do. I will also do some dirt. A bit of a rusty color here. I've actually got a, a pretty bright rust color too and, and sort of this red so uh, we'll play with these a little bit. I've grabbed my a couple of powder brushes. Um, in my drawer I have three, well really four containers that I use. Three of them, four of them are for brushes. Actually there's five of them. Uh, four of them are for brushes. One is a, a big one that's for brushes of various sizes and uses. And then I also have one for miscellaneous brushes and then one for powder brushes and then one for oil brushes. The reason that I keep those separate is once you use a brush for oils you don't want to use it for powders and vice versa because uh, you don't know what's going to, what kind of effect it's going to have. These are powder brushes and what we're going to do here is we're just going to start with some of the blue. And I'm going to use a relatively flat brush and just dip some of that in there and we're going to just sort of brush it up under there. And you can see that that gives that faded appearance almost right away. Now what I can't tell from this car, or from this photo I should say, is the roof details. I don't know how far up that car this fade goes. I'm going to kind of run it across there. Hopefully stay off the the cords here. I can clean that off later. And the nice thing about the pan pastels, especially if you've got the chalky or, or rough finish from the flat matte sealant, it goes on pretty easily and, and sticks well. So that has faded that pretty quickly and uh, consistently across there. It has faded the the rust areas on there as well, but a couple of dabs of, of water or something else of wet on there will take care of that. But for this side I'm going to actually try and work around that rust so that I don't have to worry about that so much. But I really like this light blue tint for really fading blue cars because they, they do tend to fade pretty heavily. You can see I'm trying to work around those rust spots there. It is kind of hard to get around those um, and not touch them at all so I think what I'm going to do is 
not worry too, too much about it. I'm just gonna go back and remove some of the pan pastel. If you've watched my previous videos, you know I've always got my blending, blending brush here to kind of blend things in. If we compare, compare the look of the photo with the look on the car, it's, it's getting there pretty quickly. So what I'm gonna do,